Thank you, Christopher, if that, if that was you remembering to record. <laughs> okay, is this visible to you guys? Yes, looks yes. good. Okay, awesome sounds, okay. Excellent. And Major, I have your I have your pictures, so I can just let me know whenever you're, you want yours to come up. I'm gonna I already want to do it. Okay. I'm going to try this too real quick. Yeah, please, go ahead. Great. Yes, yes. Everybody sees that? Okay. Right. That's good. Okay, well, let's go ahead and jump in since we're already running a few minutes late and we were already worried about time because we have so much just greatness uh, in one event here. Uh, welcome everyone to Beyond Bent, LGBTQ plus histories in Texas. I am Dr. Whitney Nell Stewart, Assistant Professor of History here at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm so happy to welcome you to the last teach in event of the 2021-2022 academic year. Indeed, this is the second year of the teach in's existence, and we're so happy that it uh, will continue to uh, do the work that it's doing in the next academic year as well. But this has been really uh, an amazing year of programming. I want everyone to know that they can check out uh, programming from the year on YouTube, and I'll put the links in for that and a few other things I'll be um, talking about here in just a minute. So you can check out some of the program we did, events on equity and internships, menstrual equity, trans recognition, respect and rights in higher ed, as well as reproductive justice. Uh, if you want to get updates on future events or to join the planning collective, you can join the mailing list. I'll put that link in the chat just in a second here. And we're always looking for members, uh, new members to join our planning collective. We really love this collective because it brings together students, staff, and faculty. You can send us an email. I'll put the email address in the link if you want to join us and help create teach and programming. Again, this is not just for UTD faculty. We not only want, we encourage, we need the work and help and uh, brilliance of students and staff as well. And finally, we are very proud that this series values the expertise and time of our brilliant panelists by compensating them. So we hope you'll help sustain this ongoing work and consider donating if you can. I'll put the link to our funding page in the chat here in just a moment. Now I do wanna get going right away because we've got so many spectacular folks to hear from today. But I wanna introduce our moderator for the day, UTD's very own Christopher Trevino. Christopher Trevino holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music and a, fine, a Master's of Fine Arts from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Chris has designed or operating lighting for venues across the country, including SeaWorld San Diego and San Antonio, Dead White Zombies, Cincinnati Ballet, Collin County Ballet Theater, Santa Fe Opera, Opera New Jersey, ABC News, WFAA TV, Nevada Ballet, Nevada Conservatory Theater, Collin Theater Center, Stage or Manor, Six Flags Over Texas. It could just go on and on. There are so many that he's worked for. He's also served multiple roles for the nonprofit organization Junior Players. These roles include co producer, assistant director, including for Little Shop of Horrors and American Idiot projections designer, lighting designer, and technical advisor. He currently serves as the assistant technical director here at the University of Texas at Dallas, where he teaches the technical theater classes and serves as resident lighting designer. Chris also serves as an associate lighting designer for Premier Illuminations Lighting Company that creates and designs for venues and productions all around the world. Help me welcome Christopher Trevino, who will welcome our panelists and we'll get started with this wonderful event. Christopher. Hi everyone, how's it going? Good afternoon. Um, good to see everyone um, virtually. Uh, so we had, last night we had a great uh, uh, show. Um, had a great, we had a, another teacher in last night that was on um, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion in the arts um, that will be posted later on today. 
um, for, uh, I think, I believe on the uh, Arts and Humanities Facebook page. Um, there'll be a link and you can actually watch the YouTube um, uh, recording of it. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce our panelists and I'll do this, I'll do all the panelists at once and then um, each, each uh, panelist can, can present. Um, Gregory D. Smithers is professor, professor, wow, professor of American history and eminent scholar at Virginia Commonwealth University and a British Academy Global Professor at the University of Hull in England. His research focuses on Cherokee and Southeastern indigenous history, as well as gender, sexuality, racial, and environmental history. His most recent book published this week by Beacon Press, congratulations, um, uh, is Reclaiming Two Spirits, Sexuality, Spiritual, Renewal, and Sovereignty in Native America. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we also have Jean um, Alviar uh, is a first generation college student studying US history, specializing in queer history in the American South and Southwest, and uh, specifically Texas in the 20th century. His research seeks to place queer studies and Southwest borderlands in the same conversation by examining the development of Latinx queer identity within the confines of a Mexican American culture and religious tradition. Uh, so welcome, welcome Jean. Uh, Chris Klein Hernandez is a uh, Global American Studies postdoctoral post fellow in the Charles Warren Center for Studies and American History at Harvard University and an incoming assistant professor of history at Connecticut College. His scholarship, which explores comparative uh, racialization and militarization within the 19th and 20th century US Southwest um, is situated at the nexus of Latinx studies and uh, Borderlands History. He is currently working on a book project based upon his dissertation, uh, which is entitled uh, Militarizing the Mexican Border, a study of U.S. Army forts as contact zones. So welcome, Chris. Uh, Wesley Phelps is an assistant professor of history at the University of North Texas, where he teaches uh, courses on recent United States history, the American South and LGBTQ history. His first book, A People's War on Poverty, Urban Politics and Grassroots Activists in Houston was published by the University of Georgia Press in 2014. He also has published articles in the Journal of Southern History and Peace and Change. His forthcoming book, Before, uh, Before Lawrence v. Texas, The Making of a Queer Social Movement, will be published by the University of Texas Press later this year. So welcome, Wesley. And Mark, also known by his nickname, Major uh, Jimenez, uh, is an educator activist and veteran bartender at several of the Dallas's uh, premier gay bars, including the Roundup Saloon and the Dallas Eagle. During the 1970s and 1980s, Mark uh, was active in ACT UP and uh, GUTS, uh, which is uh, Gay Urban Tree Squad, and through those groups participated in many protests for increased AIDS awareness, as well as equal rights for what is now called the LGBT community. Uh, in addition to receiving his master's degree in curriculum and instruction, Mark participated in the fight for marriage equality in Texas. In 2012, uh, with his future husband, Beau, Mark was jailed in their effort to win marriage rights. These days, Mark is retired and lives with his husband in Little Elm, Texas with their uh, uh, clouder of cats. So welcome, Major. Okay, uh, so let's, um, let's get started with Gregory. Hey, thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Um, Thank you for having me. This is a great initiative and a great idea. So I hope it's gone well uh, the past two years. And I didn't know this was the last one of the year. So I'm kind of feeling the pressure now uh, to make this uh, more impressive than I had planned it would be. Um, but thanks, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm coming to you from a hotel room in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, so I just want to put that out there because those awful curtains behind me are not my style. Uh, so that is why uh, you see, and that ugly red chair there, ooh, hideous. Um, I'd also like, for since we're recording, uh, for the record, I think I'm not alone in this in saying that after two years of pandemic, we'd all like to set teams on fire. Um, <laughs> so uh, that being said, let me share my screen with you and get started um, giving you just a brief, let me maximize that if I can here. Where are we? There we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so yes, thank you. Um, this is a uh, sign outside of the um, Bay Area Two-Spirit uh, Association powwow was the last one that was held in person uh, back in 2019. 
Um, and I was there uh, talking to friends, uh, new and old, as I, I write about in my book that just came out um, this week. Um, just sort of talking to people, getting, um, getting reacquainted with, with old friends and meeting new friends. Um, and as often happens at, at two spirit powwows that now occur around the country, um, there was a lot of talk of, of both history, uh, but also contemporary uh, political and cultural uh, events as well. Um, and so it's really interesting attending um, modern uh, powwows, um, whether they're two spirit or not, because often the events um, of the past and the present sort of come together. Um, and I, I really find that um, quite, quite thrilling and quite engaging uh, as a historian, um, uh, which go, runs very much counter to the way some of our politicians want to define history at the moment as something that is um, siloed in the past, it's happened, it's gone, uh, now we're in a better, more progressive, or maybe less progressive present, uh, depending on your perspective. But in Native cultures, that's just not the case. And that's particularly true uh, when we're talking about two-spirit histories and culture. And so the book I wrote, like much of the work that I do, is trying to reconnect with uh, some of those aspects of, of Indigenous histories that um, my colleagues in the history profession don't often focus on. And so I'm really coming from an Indigenous, trying to come as an outsider with an Indigenous perspective uh, and to narrate those in a way that um, integrates, uh, in, in this current case, two-spirit histories into uh, our, our both academic and popular discussions um, of, of American history. And so I talk about two spirits going back over 500 years in, in the current book. Um, and to do that, I have to explain where this term came from. Um, as many of you are probably aware, it's a very modern term that comes out of a Winnipeg gathering um, of American Indian gay and bisexual trans people um, in 1990s, it was the third gathering. Um, and they met just north of Winnipeg, which is a traditional meeting ground for native peoples from, from a variety of different cultures um, historically prior to European uh, colonial invasion, as the image on the screen indicates. So it was really appropriate um, that, that people from around the Americas came to this particular uh, gathering. Uh, and indeed, there was invitations extended to um, gay Aboriginal people in Australia as well. So it was genuinely from the beginning, um, an international gathering um, of gay, lesbian and bisexual uh, people. And it's at that gathering that the term, the Ojibwe term, the Ojibwe being uh, an Algonquin speaking people, uh, that the term Nij Manaduag was uh, adopted uh, as the term translated into English as two spirit, um, as an umbrella term to talk about the vast diversity of, of gender fluidity and sexual identities uh, that continue to live and, and innovate and survive through the experiences of colonialism. Um, those, the gatherings, the international gatherings have continued as the, um, some of those posters there indicate uh, since 1990. But it's important to point out that the gathering in 1990 was not only significant for the use of the terminology to spirit or the adoption of the terminology to spirit, um, but it was also important because that was at the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic and delegates at that meeting were, were hyper uh, aware of how many of the elders and leaders in their communities were really struggling to come to terms with, with that pandemic. Uh, and so getting healthcare and awareness into many communities was, was a struggle for many of the people that I, I talked to for the book. Um, messages of, of safe sex, of awareness about trans and um, uh, uh, sexuality more generally were, were really a struggle in at this time. And a lot of it had to do with homophobia that existed not only in, in white America, uh, but also in, in Indian country as well. Um, and so the term to spirit then was, was not only tied then to sort of bringing people together of, of, of fluid gender and sexual identities, but it was really about raising awareness of the, 
the very important need to have specific and culturally sensitive um, health and social services um, for people we now have come to appreciate as two spirit. And that was part of the advertising campaigns also uh, that many of the people who are now elders in the two spirit community came up with as, as this particular uh, advertisement indicates. Um, but I begin my study in my, my recent book um, in Texas, actually, uh, among the Cuchindado people, um, there's a long history of gender fluidity and sexual fluidity throughout um, not only the Gulf region uh, of what is today the United States, but uh, throughout the American South and up into the uh, Great Lakes region. Um, and it's in this region that uh, we see uh, the Cuchindados traditions coming under attack from, from Spanish uh, conquistadors and invaders. Um, and that I, I use that example in the book because it really does set out um, a framework for how many of the future transactions or interactions, I should say, between indigenous communities and Europeans um, play out over the, over the coming centuries and continue to seemingly cycle through our contemporary politics, many of the resonances of, of those early encounters. Um, and as, as I pointed out, I just want to indulge me for, for a quick second here um, in talking about Debaca and his encounter with people that he referred to as, quote, impotent and effeminate men among the Cuchindado. Um, these were individuals that uh, Devaka believed were engaged in, quote, a devilish thing. And he goes on to say that these were unmanly men, um, reporting that they go about dressed as women and do women's tasks and shoot with a bow and carry great burdens, and they are huskier than other men and taller. Um, and so, as I say, it's, a lot of a lot of the um, framework uh, is set out here for many of the perceptions, or should I say, misperceptions uh, of gender and, and sexual fluidity within native communities uh, in in Devaka's words. Um, and by framework, what I mean is the the sort of not really understanding what's going on within these communities and being disgusted because of that of engaging in uh, analytical leaps of logic, um, of contradiction within, logical contradictions within their arguments. And all of that sort of implodes in on itself and then results in this uh, immense amount of violence, both physical violence at the historical moments in which the, many of these encounters take place, uh, and, but also violence to the, to the archive, to the written, records of, of American colon or colonialism across the Americas. Um, and so that really runs through um, much of what we're, we see then unfolding as it relates to gender and sexual fluidity over the next 500 years. Famous image uh, on the screen here of quote unquote sodomites being literally thrown to the dogs in an act of, of explicit genocide. And one of the things I should point out about examples like this, and I'm happy to talk in more depth about this in, in question and answer, is that the people that are labeled with these offensive terms like sodomite and hermaphrodites, um, these are people who are knowledge keepers. They are trusted elders. They are people with very important tasks that bring together both uh, people who identify as men and women in, in their respective communities, but also perform important tasks in bringing together human and more than human uh, kin relations uh, in, in their respective uh, localities. This type of violence, though, imp it's important to note, runs through the historical consciousness of, of trans and two-spirit people in Indian country to this day. And as I write about in Reclaiming Two Spirits, the, the the tragic and very violent murder of Fred Martinez at the beginning of the century um, had echoes of, of that Spanish violence in the early 16th century. Um, 
I'm not going to say too much more to, to leave time, adequate time for my fellow panelists, but suffice it to say that what we're doing in reclaiming two spirits, in working together with two spirit people in, in the book that I've written and in other projects that are ongoing uh, with other community activists, um, community organizers, and scholars, is we're overcoming, we're trying to put finally to bed um, offensive language like the dash that that ran through so much of the history of gender and sexual fluidity um, in Native American history. Uh, and as I've often told people over the years of researching this book, I was at a conference not 10 years ago when that term that you see there on the screen uh, was used by a historian uh, to refer to people uh, of gender and sexual uh, fluidity of orientations that contradicted the rigid binary prescriptions uh, of Western gendered and sexual thinking. Um, so there's so much more to say, but I am going to um, stop sharing my screen for the moment uh, and make way for my fellow panelists and hopefully we can have a, uh, a wonderful and engaging uh, conversation. Great. Thank you very much, Gregory. Uh, next up is Jean. Uh, all right, yes, uh, and thank you uh, everyone for being here today. I really appreciate uh, this time to show my work and my research. And um, also I'm going to try and keep this uh, short because of the restrictions on time. <laughs> but today I'm gonna to be talking about my work on female impersonators. Specifically, I'll be discussing their presence and reception by Texas society in the middle of the 20th century as they engaged in behavior that opposed the heteronormative gender and sexual norms of society. So I would like to uh, start off quickly with this image here. This is where my research began. Uh, this is an advertisement for the Wagon Wheel nightclub. Um, the Wagon Wheel was, uh, a common nightclub in the outskirts of downtown Houston, Texas, which proudly featured female impersonators and acted as a queer meeting space from around 1936 to 1939. Here we can see another advertisement for the wagon wheel. Uh, and this lists the identifications of the performers at the club, as well as it gives us its location. You can see the headliner of the club is one called Del Leroy or otherwise known as Houston's own boy stylist. Uh, sadly, in the modern day, um, where the wagon wheel once stood now exists a strip mall in true uh, Houston fashion. And um, that these are the only images and information that remain of the wagon wheel. Sadly, it was burned down in an act of arson in late 1936, 38, apologies. Um, and um, yes, and so, um, yes, it burned down in arson, sadly. No one was ever identified in the uh, in the criminal investigation. However, what the wagon wheel represented and who it hosted did not disappear. Female impersonators persisted and continued to resist uh, this overt violence and criminalization prior to the wagon wheel and afterwards. Here's another advertisement from uh, Club Plantation in Corpus Christi, uh, uh, Texas, apologies. Um, you, here you can see Del Leroy is featured prominently on the uh, the news, uh, the news ad. This was again in 1938. So you can see that he transferred from the wagon wheel to the Corpus Christi area in pursuit of work and of employment. Um, uh, we additionally can see another article here that lists club elders also in the Corpus Christi area, but in 1936. Uh, and what's surprising about these advertisements is um, that they existed, that they show uh, that female impersonators had an audience and that they, um, they, there was a market for these individuals in the public eye. And this is shocking for a conservative state like Texas. We would think as more repressive and not willing to engage in these types of individuals' performances. And one of the possible explanations I'm wrestling with for this lies in George Chauncey's book, Gay New York, which details how respectable individuals want to seek um, things outside of their normal world uh, and encounter something that is beyond respectability. Um, you know, it's not to the same extent as in New York, as in Texas, but this visibility is still here and we can see it in the archives and in the press. However, you know, this visibility does not come without a cost. Uh, this is, an, uh, this, these are the penal codes for Texas in 1925, which lists article 607 or the vacancy article. Vacancy has long been a tool uh, used to criminalize behaviors and lifestyles that went against the express gender and social norms of society. 
And upon examining this article, it doesn't mention female impersonators by name. Rather, it lists the characteristics of individuals uh, that it seeks to target. Noticeably, it's, main, it's mainly vague language, uh, allowing for subjective and flexible enforcement by the law or the civil government. Terms like idle, immoral, honest, reputable are highly subjective terms. And female impersonators' jobs as entertainers were often thought to be immoral and not respectable forms of employment. Thus, they constantly faced this charge when under arrest. And Drew continued to perform uh, throughout the state and throughout the 20th century. They resisted this overt criminalization in a passive form of resistance in the state. Here we can see uh, an instance of how vagrancy was applied and used. This is an article from the San Antonio Light, 1936. Several female impersonators were apprehended at Club Royal in San Antonio, Texas, uh, with the local de police force disrupting the actual performance they were engaged in to arrest these individuals. They were detained without cause and held for a long period of time. However, they were able to perform for their fellow prisoners while, uh, <laughs> while awaiting sentencing. However, ultimately, they were able to uh, leave the city um, to defuse the situation. This is another article, again, from the San Antonio Light in 1938. San Antonio at this time did not seem to be a very expressive city. Uh, <laughs> again, we have instances of them being arrested at their nightclub and given the choice of leaving or facing you know, charges of vagrancy. And in this instance, the judge also condemned these individuals, chastising them and saying that they should, quote, move without any flimsy skirts on, too, end quote. And lastly, this example is from Galveston in 1947. This article it illustrates more of a, co a coordinated attempt by police to target these clubs and female impersonators. Two clubs in this article, the Granada and the Seven Seas, were targeted by the local police force. Several female impersonators were arrested and they cited the fact that they were engaging in vulgarity, gross abuse of the law and lewd performances. Additionally, the police also uh, received public informant tips about, this, um, about these clubs, informing the, uh, informing the police to their actions. And yet uh, the female impersonators still persisted. I've shown two decades of criminalization and police harassment, and yet they still persisted and continued to form throughout the state despite the legal repercussions that they could face. Uh, however, not everyone hated female impersonators. However, this, the story is not that simple. It's more complicated than that. This is an opinion article by Frey King in the San Antonio Light published in 1936. And he characterizes the public perception of female impersonators as extremely disapproving. He states, quote, that men are disgusted to see a man dolled up in woman's dress and women resent seeing a woman dressed like a man, end quote. However, in his comments, he also shows that some people like a female impersonators. He states, quote, that Women may momentarily laugh at the antics of a female impersonator, and a man may laugh and applaud at a male impersonator's performance, end quote. King demonstrates that the public's reception is not simple. It is complex, with some loving and others hating female impersonators. However, there's an outlier to, this, uh, public's, to the public's relationship with female impersonators, and that is with uh, Julian Eltage. Julian Eltage was one of the most famous female impersonators to come out of the early 20th century. He was loved throughout the Texas state press and local theater editorials. And what made Julian different from the common female impersonators like Del Leroy, like we just discussed, was that he performed in upper class institutions and theaters. Uh, <laughs> thus, the audiences between Julian and Del Leroy is markedly different. Having a high class crowd who saw Julian's work as an art form meant it was less likely to be seen as a challenge to gender norms. While Del Leroy worked in bars and nightclubs and places of low respectability, it would, it, it would mean that their, his behavior and others like Del Leroy would uh, fall outside of the societal norms and would face repercussions as they usually did. Oftentimes, common female impersonators were far more subjected to vagrancy laws than Julian Eltridge. Eltridge would never have had to fear arrest while performing in San Antonio or Texas or Austin or Dallas. And yet, common female impersonators persisted and challenged heteronormativ heteronormativity through their actions. And these actions should be celebrated as acts of defiance. But why be a female impersonator? What are, the, what are the causes that lead someone to engage in these types of behaviors? This is an article from the Vernon Daily in 1929. 
And this article has the opinions and thoughts of one professor, William Sheldon at the University of Wisconsin. And he lists three causes for men wanting to engage in female impersonation. He lists the first cause as curiosity as the opposite sex. Uh, these are men who want to know more about women and see this as a way to gain more insight into you know, women's behavior and mannerisms. The second is to quote unquote, have fun. However, this fun is based in pure misogyny because these men, uh, these men rely on disparaging and hyperinflated um, performances of women to still be seen as straight and masculine. If they fall beyond that spectrum, then that's whenever their masculinity and sexuality come into question by society. The third reason is gender dysphoria. Now, the professor at the time did not have this terminology, but uh, for the fake for the uh, fate of simplicity, I've used it here. He describes an instance in where a man has been continuously told that they should have been a girl or that they act like a, a woman or that they're effeminate. And he says, quote, that his particular appearance will probably land him at a place and time after that he may be satisfied or dissatisfied with his sex. And the, the cause for this type of realization is whenever an individual engages in female impersonation. Uh, now, the, the first two reasons are, quote unquote, normal behavior for men to engage in because of the qualifiers, because one, it's simple curiosity, or because two, it's disparaging women. However, the third reason is not, quote unquote, normal to Professor Sheldon and heteronormative society at the time. He goes to great lengths to normalize the masculine men engaging in female impersonation, but he quickly dismisses uh, those who, quote, attempt to disguise their true sex from all the people with whom they came into contact with as, quote, mentally ill, end quote. This article shows that female impersonation is, is a route to realizing individuals' latent gender dysphoria in the early 20th century, as well as showing that transgender individuals did exist throughout our history. Now, I'd like to quickly end with one last word about this article here. This is an article published in 1905 in the Austin American Statesman. The story is from Washington, Ohio, but the fact that it's being reprinted in the Austin press illustrates that there is an audience and readership interested in this type of news. This is the story of one Randolph Milborn, a female impersonator in his, in his town who is about to undergo sex reassignment surgery. And this article details their experience from a child to their adult life. And it details the fact that they quote, Recall, uh, that he recalls uh, from his earliest boyhood days that he's always had an inordinate desire to be a female and to dress, live, and act as a woman, end quote. And they're in, in, their, uh, in their adult life. Uh, they've been embroiled in a civic battle because they want to dress as a woman outside of their own home. And after facing arrest, Melbourne uh, was ordered by the judge to cease and desist all action dressing as a female outside of his home. Um, however, Milbourne fought back. He, he issued a legal challenge to combat this oppression from his uh, local civic government. Sadly, this is the end of the story. It doesn't continue. And at this time, I don't know about uh, Milbourne's fight. But the resistance and those of the female impersonators I've shown and mentioned throughout this presentation are important to our collective uh, history as, LGBT, as an LGBTQ community. They are a powerful symbol of our perseverance and show, to all of, and show to all of us that we've always been here and we're not going away. We will resist as we have done before. And so I would like to thank you guys for your, uh, for your attention. This was a really quick wrap up of my presentation, but I hope um, it was clear, clear enough for you all to understand. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jean. Uh, let's go to Chris now. Can folks see my PowerPoint? Yes. And awesome. Yes. Great. Well, now I'll take you on a trip all the way to far west Texas to El Paso, where I'm from. And I'll be talking about some of my ethnographic and oral history work uh, that was conducted on queer nightlife. This presentation will mainly focus on nightclubs and uh, the history of cruising between El Paso and then Ciudad Juarez. So in front of you, you see a picture of the Oak Plantation. This is a, a, a long-standing queer nightclub in El Paso. And then of course, there's some pictures of folks inside of it, uh, building space and community. First, I'll talk about a prehistory, thinking about the larger region, and then we'll get into the nitty and gritty of, of the Oak Plantation. 
In the early 1960s, with the second wave of feminism proposed by Betty Friedan and Cold War sentiment, 1960s El Paso looked very different for queer, specifically gay and lesbian communities. El Paso lesbian Cristina Hernandez recalls that during the 1960s, lesbians who did not have cruising spots would enter Ciudad Juarez to partake in illicit activities, both with uh, drugs and sex. Ever since the 1950s, Ciudad Juarez was deemed a cultural hotspot for Northern Mexico and the Southwest U United States bringing famous celebrities like Marilyn Monroe and James Dean, who publicized their um, uh, lifestyles within the city. Scholars such as Rachel St. John have shown that most Northwestern Mexican border cities experienced a golden age of vice and international nightlife. Cristina Hernandez, uh, the El Paso lesbian that one of the El Paso lesbians I interviewed, explained that Ciudad Juarez became, quote, a city of sexual expression that lesbians could retreat to when living, not living their lives as heterosexual women in El Paso, end quote. For several decades, El Pasoan queers not only separated their public uh, and private lives, but traversed Ciudad Juarez from El Paso to also uh, perform and embrace their sexual lives. One of the first nightclubs created in El Paso was the Pet, the Pet Shop. This was a lesbian owned uh, nightclub that lasted from the 50s and 60s. Other gay clubs existed. However, most people remember the Pet Shop due to its ephemera and its archive located at UTEP, University of Texas El Paso, that shows many lesbians partaking in creating community. In the mid 1970s, Dallas based company Craven Entertainment dispatched businessman Bob Bonaventure to scout for alternative bar, uh, bar locations that would bring lesbian, gay, and hetero disco communities into one space in West Texas. Bonaventure, according to friend and co worker Jack Klinikowalski, was thought to believe that the trade secret to gaining a large audience, whether gay or straight, was to position a large alternative club away from other clubs and in a border city. Klinikowalski, an Anglo-American El Paso native who also worked in queer bars in Houston and Dallas, explained that Bonaventure purchased a space within Central El Paso. And this is more of a working class Chicano district within El Paso Center. In 1977, Bob Bonaventure bought a plot at 219 South Ochoa Street, which would become the Old Plantation, the city's longest standing queer nightclub. During its first year, the bar included, uh, quote, multiple performances of drag shows, foam parties, all girl nights, and military nights, end quote. As most people know, El Paso is home to the Fort Bliss Military Reservation, which was plotted in, uh, right after the U.S. War with Mexico in 1848. Many people who would enter the OP were military soldiers and officers. In one oral history, an officer explained that the OP featured, quote, whites, blacks, Mexicans, and Puerto Ricans, lesbians and gays, and everything else in between, end quote. The OP, like the pet shop, the uh, lesbian owned lesbian space bar, became a prime location for same sex sensual expressions and intimate encounters. Irma Montolongo, another participant, mentioned that the most unique part of the bar was the quote, female bathroom, where quote, lesbians, straight women, and most of all, drag queens congregated and interacted with each other, end quote. Montalogo recalled that the conversations that took place were illustrative of how each women viewed fashion, boys, girls, and popular culture. Quote, I remember talking about hair, dancing, music, and even learned new colloquialisms, end quote. And that was from Irma Montalogo. The bar brought the queer population of El Paso together on a single dance floor and in a closed safe space, like a female bathroom. 
Susan Stryker has argued that after 1973, transgender populations throughout the U.S. felt left out of the national gay rights discourse. In the OP, this looked different. Many transgender individuals found many communities within o the OP. So the OP was a mixed bar originally bought for a gay scene, but what I find in the oral histories is that we had everyone who would visit this bar. As legal transgender uh, rights idled, trans culture flourished in the space of the old plantation. Klinikowski points out that in the early 1970s, many trans uh, folks participated in shows uh, in, El, in El Paso, especially the OP. And the OP were, was able to bring uh, drag uh, uh, stars from other parts of the country. Chanel, a 45-year-old El Paso drag queen, recalls that on some nights, she, quote, met various trans women who told her that this was the scene as there were so many drag queens that were visible, end quote. The OP brought different sorts of gender expressive peoples into one space, but this was not entirely new as the uh, pet shop, the lesbian owned bar that was created before also had different sorts of identities being um, uh, uh, seen and projected. The difference with the OP, however, was that this space was five times bigger that allowed for different dance floors and different music that would bring in different sorts of subcultures. The reputation of the O Plantation as an alternative bar would take a moral blow after 1981 and 82, when GRID, which would later be deemed AIDS, HIV, changed the sexual politics of the bar. Soon the OP started bringing up signs asking for condom use and uh, education on HIV AIDS. Chanel and Clinical Kowalski both were called in their oral histories that this altered the way that queens and queers interacted in safe spaces. The erotic practice of quote barebacking was then paramount to understanding um, how people engage in sexual acts. With the entrance of uh, HIV AIDS, sexual practices changed. The OP, unlike other clubs like the pet shop, continued to attract the most diverse clientele. However, after 1987, the bar closed. The new O plantation was then erected by the same Bob Bonaventure in the 90s. Chanel, the drag queen, mentioned that the 90s New Old Plantation was centered on displaying ephemera concerning queers and military members. One thing I consider is this time period where Defense of Marriage Act and Don't Ask, Don't Tell is prevalent within military culture. So perhaps the New OP found that ephemera of militarization would bring in and allure queers and everyone in between into the club. Bonaventure was correct. By the 2000s, the OP started to see larger and larger uh, uh, populations attend the club. The club's dance floors allowed for multiple performativities of gender and sexuality. Klinikowski mentions that even, quote, straight men would come to the club, end quote, along with uh, friends to partake in the drag shows. But after 2001, Chanel and Klinikowski noted that many straight presenting male uh, veterans and soldiers from Fort Bliss would enter the club looking to find young Latino males. Because of that, more and more of the uh, club parties then presented a military angle. So this, what this meant was that when advertising, uh, the OP always tried to include pictures of soldiers who were coming out or uh, activities that would bring these populations together. It is notable that the impact of Fort Bliss and its men had a unique position in terms of the behavior of people who attended the club. The presence of Fort Bliss had long been felt throughout the uh, OP 
since its opening, original opening in 1977. Kunikowski and Chanel revealed in their oral histories that the OP's dance stage was filled with military personnel, not just of Anglo or Euro-American descent, but of Puerto Rican and African-American descent. What this did was make the space multicultural. While El Paso has a predominantly Latinx slash Mexican, Mexican American population, the OP was a space that sustained different sorts of um, racial backgrounds. In 2013, the club closed once again, and it was reopened then by two uh, gay Latino men Edward Santian and Jean Morales, who decided to advertise the club as a space that would be exclusively gay cis male, but would not focus so much on the military and rather on uh, current gay culture. This culture through the late 2000s would include things like America's Next Top Model, but by the 20 teens, we start to see uh, RuPaul and um, uh, RuPaul's empire of drag race being seen in, in the clubs. The 2010s, quote, saw a steady interest back in the new OP, and many people decided that this space would now be exclusively gay cis male. But by the end of the 2010s, Santian and Morales, the two gay Latino men who reopened this club, then decided to include uh, nights for heterosexual people to come. By the 2020s, now we start to see homonational imagery in that we're starting to bring back in uh, ephemera of the military, but we also see how this club, which had been exclusively gay cis male, was now again open and mixed depending on um, what, not just on one's um, uh, sexual orientation, but uh, also their racial background. In the history of your sexuality, the old plantation can help us uh, uh, make visible the history of queer nightlife in El Paso as a space that was multicultural, but multiracial. While El Paso is a predominantly Latinx uh, city, studying this nightclub helps us see how this space was inherently open and uh, um, uh, illustrative of uh, gay and lesbian uh, activism throughout the late 20th century. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. Um, uh, now we are uh, on to, oh my gosh, I just lost my notes. Cheesy wheezy. Um, <laughs> I think I'm next. Wesley, yes, sorry, <laughs> so sorry, Wesley. I'm no sorry. problem. I was going back through, I'm, yes, on to Wesley, thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, so thank you to Whitney and everyone else who made this uh, possible. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Lawrence v. Texas. I wanna talk about kind of the historical roots of Lawrence v. Texas and why they're important for understanding this ongoing movement for queer equality. Uh, but let's start with Lawrence. Uh, so on September 17th, 1998, Harris County uh, Sheriff's deputies burst into a second floor apartment unit on the east side of Houston. A few minutes prior to this, uh, someone had used a payphone in the courtyard of this apartment complex uh, to call the police claiming that there was a crazy man with a gun in the apartment. So the police came and they reported that instead of finding a dangerous situation with a firearm, instead they found two men in the apartment having sex. They subsequently arrested John Lawrence and Tyrone Garner for violating section 2106 of the state penal code, which was also known as the homosexual conduct law. This statute made it a class C misdemeanor to engage in oral or anal sex with a member of the same sex. Now, most people arrested for violating 2106 in this period, certainly by the late 1990s, they usually quietly paid their $200 fine and moved on with their lives. But queer activists in Texas had been waiting for an opportunity like this to challenge the constitutionality of 2106. 
And several of those activists in Houston found out about the arrests of John Lawrence and Tyrone Garner and uh, approached them about being plaintiffs in a new case against the state sodomy law. So Lawrence and Garner became reluctant activists uh, in this cause uh, to try to overturn 2106. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Their legal team argued that 2106 violated the privacy and equal protection rights of gay and lesbian Texans. And they eventually won their case in the US Supreme Court. In 2003, uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, that uh, Texas's 2106 and state sodomy laws like it in 13 additional states violated the constitutional right of privacy. Now, one interesting note here, and you might already be aware of this, is that Lawrence and Garner were probably not actually having sex on the night that they were arrested. Uh, which seems like a minor point, except when you consider how it shows just how capriciously this law could be used. Ostensibly, 2106 was a conduct law, meaning it outlawed certain conduct. But in practice, it operated as a status law because it could be used with impunity against gay and lesbian Texans, regardless of whether they violated the specific conduct outlined in the statute. So Lawrence v. Texas laid the foundation for victories for queer rights after 2003. When we think about the congressional repeal of the military policy of don't ask, don't tell in 2010, or the Supreme Court's partial nullification of the Defense of Marriage Act in 2013 in US v. Windsor, the Supreme Court's marriage equality ruling in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015, the Supreme Court's extension of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act to gay, lesbian, and transgender workers in 2020 in Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia. When we think about the wave of local victories that have occurred across the country since 2003, none of those would have been possible without Lawrence v. Texas. It seems inconceivable that those victories could have been achieved if gays and lesbians still had been criminalized in 14 states uh, in the country. So in my forthcoming book, uh, Before Lawrence v. Texas, The Making of a Queer Social Movement, which depending on supply chain issues is gonna be out sometime between October and February, um, but also hopefully in a companion podcast series that's gonna be released during Pride Month in 2023, I investigate legal challenges to Texas sodomy laws beginning in the late 19th century and extending through Lawrence v. Texas in 2003. And in the book, I argue that Lawrence v. Texas itself would not have been possible without several decades of queer legal activism in Texas. In other words, Lawrence v. Texas did not come out of nowhere. So today with just a few minutes, I wanna mention just a few of those cases. I want to talk about the historical roots uh, of Lawrence v. Texas. One of the first really important cases was Buchanan v. Batchelor. I want to start with that case because this was the first federal victory against the state sodomy law in Texas. There are cases against the sodomy law that actually go back to 1867, and I document those in the book, but this is the first federal victory and helped lay the groundwork uh, for Lawrence. So in February 1969, Alvin Buchanan was arrested twice, once in a public restroom at Reverchon Park in Dallas, and again in a public restroom at a Sear, in a Sears department store. He was arrested and charged with violating the state sodomy law. Now at the time, the sodomy law was Article 524. This was the predecessor to 2106. And that law made it a crime to engage in oral or anal sex for anyone. Same-sex couples, opposite-sex couples, married couples, non-married couples, oral and anal sex had been prohibited by Article 524. So Buchanan filed a case in federal district court challenging the constitutionality of the state sodomy law. He said it violated um, his privacy rights that had been defined by Griswold v. Connecticut, right? The 1965 case, 
uh, relating to uh, a married couple and their decision to use birth control, to use contraception. Griswold v. Connecticut had um, identified a fundamental right to privacy in the Constitution. So Buchanan used that to argue that the state sodomy law violated his fundamental right to privacy. Now, his attorney decided to add some more plaintiffs to the case to try to get a little bit more traction since this was so unprecedented in federal court. So they got Michael and Janet Gibson to join the case as a married heterosexual couple. They would represent married couples who engaged in the prohibited uh, conduct. And then they also got Travis Strickland to join uh, as a gay man who had never been arrested for violating the state sodomy law, but who feared prosecution. In November 1969, federal judge Sarah T. Hughes ruled that uh, Article 524 did indeed violate constitutional privacy protections, but only those of the married couple. So she said that um, because they're married, Griswold v. Connecticut was about a married couple determining whether or not they're going to use contraception. And so she extended that to the married couples. So it's not a huge victory for Alvin Buchanan. Certainly wasn't a victory for him who had to serve out his five-year pr prison sentence um, and just suffered under deplorable conditions while in prison. We know about that from the letters he wrote to the Los Angeles Advocate while he was there. It's not a victory for him. It's not a huge victory for gay and lesbian Texans. But this was the first time that a federal district court struck down a state sodomy. Show alert. Test uh, this is a test of the U.N. Sorry about that. My, my university is testing its alert system, its emergency alert system. I, I figured it would happen right in the middle of my presentation, and it did. Um, so this is the first time a federal district court struck down a state sodomy law based on constitutional um, uh, on constitutional grounds. By the mid-1970s, Texas had a new sodomy law that was targeted specifically at gay and lesbian Texans. 2106 criminalized oral and anal sex only if engaged in by two members of the same sex. So in 1979, Dallas gay activist Don Baker filed a federal lawsuit arguing that 2106 violated privacy and equal protection rights uh, of gay and lesbian Texans. And he won in 1982 in Judge Jerry Buckmeyer's court. Uh, Judge Jerry Buckmeyer ruled that indeed Section 2106 of the Texas Penal Code violated constitutional guarantees of privacy and equal protection. Um, and it's, it's a very moving, occasionally poetic uh, ruling uh, that Buckmeyer made. However, three years later in 1985, that was overturned by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. Uh, the entire appellate court heard uh, the appeal in Baker's case, and they reasoned that Section 2106 of the state penal code was allowable because the state of Texas had, had a legitimate interest in promoting morality in society. The U.S. Supreme Court the following year refused to hear the case while simultaneously upholding a similar sodomy law in Georgia in Bowers v. Hardwick, which you've probably heard of. Incidentally, the defendant, Wade, is the same Henry Wade, the Dallas district attorney, who was the defendant in Roe v. Wade. He was also uh, eventually the defendant in Buchanan v. Batchelor. In 1989, a group of five gay and lesbian plaintiffs tried again, but this time in a state court, arguing that 2106 violated state constitutional guarantees of privacy, equal protection, and gender equality. Uh, many of you probably know this, that Texas had passed its own equal rights amendment um, uh, during the 1970s. And so part of the argument here was that the state sodomy law violated that equal rights amendment. And for the sake of time, I'm happy to answer questions about that in the Q&A. They got a favorable ruling in a district court and in an appellate court, but the Texas Supreme Court dismissed the case, arguing that criminal laws like 2106 could not be challenged in a civil court. In other words, Linda Morales and her four fellow plaintiffs had simply filed this case in the wrong court. 
Around the same time that the Morales case was happening, Micah England moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Dallas to become a police officer, and she was denied a position because she was a lesbian. She filed suit in state court in 1990, arguing that the policy discriminated, discriminated against her and that 2106, which was the basis of the Dallas Police Department's policy, was unconstitutional. She got a similarly favorable ruling in district and appellate courts, but a technicality prevented the case from reaching the state Supreme Court, and so it was unclear whether that appellate ruling she got in an Austin court applied to the entire state. So what I hope that my book and its companion podcast series will show is that the ongoing struggle for queer equality has a long history. The recent victories in the movement are the products of decades of grassroots activism aimed at ridding the nation of its discriminatory sodomy laws that tried to reduce queer Americans to the status of second-class citizens at best and criminals at worst. These victories that have been achieved since 2003 owe a tremendous debt to the activists who waged a long battle against Texas sodomy laws. These decades of grassroots organizing and agitating necessary for challenging these laws are relevant for the continuing struggle for equality, as a similar commitment will be necessary not only to bring about new victories, but also to preserve what activists have already achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, we're gonna go to Major now. Yeah, it's you. All right then. Well, I thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, I've been an activist my whole life. Um, as Dr. Hernandez may explain to us about the old plantation in El Paso, that's where I came out in the 1970s. So I'm very familiar with that bar. Um, during the 1980s, I was a member of ACT UP and the Gay Urban Truth Squad, which was called GUTS. And that was, you know, trying to get money and funding and visibility for the people that were living with AIDS. Um, that took up a lot of our time in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, but I think what I'm probably most famous for is in, um, you know, I met my husband, but I, my current husband, but we met, we fell in love. Um, we moved in together and I proposed and, he, you know, for marriage. And he said, yes, but of course, Texas didn't allow marriage back in 2012. And so um, we just thought we'd have our own little marriage. But then in May of 2012, President Obama came out with his um, epiphany on marriage equality. And he said that he thought that marriage should be for all Americans. So that's when we hatched our plan to um, go down to the Dallas Records building and apply for a marriage license. And as we thought, as we thought about it, we decided that we weren't gonna leave without a marriage license and we were gonna make our stand. So we went down there, we applied for a marriage license, we were denied. So we sat down at the front of the line and waited until they closed. Every time the clerk said next, we would say we're next, but you know, they still just moved the wrong line around us. At the end of the day, we were arrested um, for uh, criminal trespassing. Well, um, while we were deciding all that, we still had our regular marriage ceremony with our family and friends, um, even though it wasn't legal in Texas. In fact, you know, it's just, we had it just to, to show our family how committed we were to each other. Um, then in August of 2012, we had our first hearing um, in front of the judge that, you know, these things take time. So it was just a, a technicality. And we left there and um, we went back to the marriage license counter and applied for marriage license again. And um, I got arrested again because uh, there was a guy there who said, they already told you no once, so get out of here. And I thought, no, you're not gonna tell me to get out of here. I'm gonna sit here again. So I did get arrested a second time. Well, you know, eventually, um, you know, the United States Supreme Court ruled that marriage equality was for everybody. And so we were able to have our wedding. Um, I'm sorry, we were actually able to go downtown in front of a judge and get married. So, um, you know, as an activist, to me, it's important 
to stay true to yourself, stay true to your cause and never let them tell you no. You know, people were telling us, you know, if you want to get married, why don't you go to another state where it's legal? And we kept telling them that's not what we're going to do because we're Texans. This is where we live. This is where we work. This is where we pay our taxes. So you're not going to force us out. We're going to stay here and fight the fight, which we did. And um, that's pretty much my story. I know we're kind of running low on time. So I was just going to let y'all go into your questions and answers now and see what you want to uh, talk to the other people about. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to try uh, trying to unshare. There we go. Stop share. My goodness. Okay, <laughs> technology. Fun. I have I have my two screens going right now, so I'm trying to to um, uh, grab them all together. Uh, so uh, thank you, Major. Um, I let's. I guess we should open up the um, open up to any questions that any any of the uh, audience has for any of the panelists. Do we have any questions? Look at the chat. Sorry, just no, nothing yet. Um, no, uh, I I'll ask one. Um, I had a question uh, uh, for um, for everyone, and I think I think that this uh, uh, what just in general, what what made you what made y'all in, get interested in um, specifically LGBTQ uh, rights and, and um, uh, uh, to study on the history? And it can go to any, anyone y'all can answer. Don't, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> um, I'll go first real quick. Um, uh, for me, uh, LGBTQ um, history and studies and culture is is seamless with with what I do on a day to day basis uh, in, in relation to Native histories. Um, Native cultures um, don't discard people, uh, at least historically they haven't. And so uh, this to me was um, didn't seem terribly controversial or uh, weird. Um, it only seems controversial or weird in a historiographical sense. Um, if you view the historiography through a Western um, cis male um, straight uh, lens. Um, otherwise, it, whether we're talking about matrilineal or patrilineal societies, for Native peoples, um, gender and sexual fluidity, and they have their own languages for it, and various roles that people play uh, according to those specific communities. Um, it's just, it's very natural. It's like breathing air. Um, and as people said to me over and over again in, in interviews for the book, um, we don't discard people um, in Indian communities. And and so I, you know, I, I felt that that was important for um, to be put in a history book. Um, it, it's not often written about, historians don't often write about this particular aspect of, of Native history. Thank you. Uh, I can go next. Um, I grew up in rural South Texas and there's, you grow up in a rural town, there's not much on, you know, gay individuals or any, or any semblance of LGBTQ history being taught or anything like that. And so when I grew up, I grew up very isolated in the closet. And so once I got out into the world and I started going to college and I realized there is just all this information out there, I realized one that not a lot is written for Mexican Americans experiences LGBTQ individuals, but also Texas is, is almost a void. We have the major urban areas that have their own individual histories, but like what Dr. Phelps is working on is, is one of the first things I've seen in terms of like Texas LGBTQ history written that crosses and brings uh, Texas into like the focus as opposed to either the East Coast experience or the West Coast experience. So that's that's what I got interested in. I wanted to write a history that would resonate with someone here at, at like me growing up in like a rural South Texas town. 
Yeah, and I, I think for me, you know, I'm, I'm broadly interested in how democracy works and how we think democracy is supposed to work versus how it actually works on the ground. And I'm interested in how marginalized communities have fought to uh, participate in the democratic experiment. Um, and I think that uh, the Obergefell decision um, was kind of a catalyst for this project because there were so many people saying, oh, this marriage equality just kind of came out of nowhere, right? Like there was a few states that had, uh, you know, had their own marriage equality, and but, but no one thought it would be a national thing. And now people all over the country are able to get married. And there was like no sense of what the, what it took to get to that point, right? It took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of suffering uh, to get to that. As we heard from Major uh, today, that, you know, these things don't just come out of the blue. They are a result of people dedicating time, energy, sometimes their lives to bringing these changes about. So I wanted to kind of trace a longer history of that movement. And of course, Justice Anthony Kennedy um, cited Lawrence v. Texas several times in the Obergefell ruling. And when I went back to the Lawrence v. Texas decision in 2003, which Anthony Kennedy also wrote, he's writing about all of these previous cases, cases in Texas, Baker v. Wade, Morales v. Texas. And so that kind of led me on this trail uh, to trace this longer history. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to, I want to say just, uh, just a little for my own, my own um, uh, uh, history, I, I remember the, the day that, that marriage equality passed and, and um, specifically watching the, the news in the morning and knowing that some of the, you know, the, the opinions were going to come out, that they were going to rule on it and, that, and they didn't really know if it was going to be that day. And then watching on ESPN and, and going, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And then walk, going, I got to celebrate. There's got to be, I got to go somewhere. And so went down to, um, went to Garland to a, a brewery that um, was giving away uh, free glasses that said LGBT, uh, LGBT, which is loving great beer together. And it's a local beer company. Uh, and so went down there, I got the glass. And then I went out that night and they had a march from um, Cathedral of Hope, which is here in Dallas down to the, um, what is it called major? The, the, cir the circle, the love, nah, I'm going to, it's like right at the corner of Cedar Springs and Oaklawn, um, but it's a it's a it's a memorial or like a, a site. But it's everybody just crowded around there, and we all just we had I don't know. It's just it's one of those those few times, and I know that like this is more of another conversation, but um, few times that I felt as as though the community came together, and we were a community as a whole, and not subsects of different you know entities. Um, and I remember that night going to the Eagle and telling major thank you very much it's it's because of you specifically here that also paved the way to help uh bring marriage equality so i i just uh wanted to add add that in um i have a we have a question for dr phelps um uh how can we make sure texas students learn about these cases yeah that's a great question uh so i it's a little easier for me at the university level uh, to make sure. So, so I teach an LGBTQ history course here uh, that we're now offering every year. Um, so that's one way to do it. We're also, you know, I'm also kind of an evangelizer uh, to my colleagues here about getting more LGBTQ history uh, into their courses, no matter what the courses are. We're actually uh, reviewing our entire curriculum uh, right now, and uh, we're making, or we've been asked to make short videos, kind of giving our colleagues some advice and tips on how to make our curriculum more inclusive. And so I'm making a couple of videos, um, encouraging them to get more LGBTQ history into their courses. Be, you know, at the K through 12 level, it's, it's becoming much more difficult, uh, as you know, and uh, I, I simply don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I think we have to keep speaking up. I think we have to uh, keep putting the pressure on our legislators to do the right thing, even when we're sure that they're not going to, um, but it's gonna be a difficult road ahead. I think we do have some dark days ahead uh, as far as uh, free speech and, and getting some of this information out, unfortunately. 
Thank you. Uh, think, Whitney? Also do is oh, sorry, perhaps, sorry. Um, send uh, Governor Abbott uh, a box with a lovely bow on it with all of our books um, so that he can get some social emotional learning. I agree. That's I agree. a great idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, say, I'll say just to speak to the, the show that I'm doing, um, it's, it's doing shows like, like Bent um, and bringing that into um, the university. I think that, uh, and not all of my, just so y'all know, just the kind of the overview of the cast, not everyone is LGBTQ plus. Um, and so it was a journey for them. And we spent two weeks doing um, table work on the show and learning about the history of, you know, how Berlin was the gay Mecca. And then all of a sudden paragraph 175 immediately changed that. And um, a lot of them didn't know about the, the persecution of homosexuals in the Holocaust. And I think that you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a great, it was a great learning opportunity for them. Um, so, uh, Whitney, uh, let's go to Whitney. You had a question. Yeah. And just one other addition of something that people can do. The Texas Education Agency is cu currently looking for content advisors for the, the TEKS, the Texas Essential Skills, Knowledge and Skills. So if you are a historian, even if you're not, and you care about what is being taught in schools, you can apply to be a content advisor. So I highly suggest everyone go do that. Maybe like right after this. But a uh, question for y'all. So this is something that I grapple with as a historian of slavery, which is where and how to find the balance between um, resistance and oppression. Because the, the kind of taking the pendulum, swinging it to one side, can leave so much out of the picture that I often can, you know, see students just so desperate to find if we only are looking at the oppressive qualities and structures, uh, students just needing that kind, they need to see the resistance. But then if they swing too far on the other side, they think, ah, everything is done. Marriage equality is passed. We're all good. We don't need to worry about the fact that there are still these structures in place that possibly could have us be um, going backwards. So just in your own work, both research, uh, or not both, but research writing and in the classroom, as well as activism, and just talking to people um, on the street, how do you kind of find that balance between saying, resistance and agency is is a core part of the story, but also we have to recognize that there are these oppressive um, policies and practices and structures in place. I know that's a huge question, but you know, we have six minutes, so y'all can just solve that problem for me, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try and answer it. Um, it, it, it. As you saw in my presentation, I use uh, passive resistance, which is more colloquially associated with African American history. But it, it's very useful because you're right. We have to balance between, you know, all these stories of oppression uh, and degradation, and discrimination uh, for the community. But like within, out of all of that comes some form of resistance. And whether or not it's active, like what Dr. Phelps is working on. Or what if it's more passive where an individual just keeps repeating the same behavior that they're being told not to engage in? It, it's not, like, I, it's very difficult to balance, but I hopefully by addressing both at the same time, you kind of get the picture that, yes, it's bad, but people are still trying to work to make it better. Yeah, I, I agree with Jean. I mean, highlighting the struggle, I think, is what's really important. And that's how I kind of find the balance. You know, all, all of the cases I write about end in failure. Um, so I think what's, the, what's important about these cases is the struggle to get there and the long-term effects that they eventually had, right? I mean, because all of these cases contributed to a more long-term victory. So, so the struggle is important. I think that's what we should be highlighting. Yeah, just to echo, I, I agree with both Wesley and, and Jean. Um, it's not easy. It's a constant balance, balancing act. Um, but from my perspective and the communities I work with um, in Indian country, um, just existing, just being is a form of resistance. Um, knowing that these traditions have survived the cauldron of colonialism that is ongoing um, is an act of resistance. Um, so, so there is that, and there, and there's also a recognition. 
I think that there's different forms of, of resistance. Um, some of it's very active. Um, some of it's it's quieter and, and more out of the spotlight and not what we necessarily define as resistance. Um, so resistance comes in many forms. And, and, and I think part of resistance is just being and living in quiet dignity as well. Um, and, and to be honest, that's what a lot of queer indigenous people want um, is, is to live in quiet dignity in a way that they can reconnect uh, to the circle, to their communities um, and, 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 and to do that and to, and to love and to be um, as, as they feel is right for them and right for their communities. Well, in my opinion, if, um, if you see something wrong, you have to be an upstander. Or don't just be a bystander. You need to go in there and you may not be trans, but the trans people are having a hard time. You can support them, you know, learn from them, you know, make friends with some trans people if you don't know anything about them and just understand that it's, it's a fight for all of us. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. Some of these things we've been fighting for for, for decades, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, but we just have to stay in the game. We have to just keep keep focusing our attention on what they're doing and what we can do to combat it. Yep, oh, I agree. Uh, we have another question uh, for any panelists. What are some of your favorite historical archives for your research, either in general or Texas, Texas excuse me, specific? Um, and to uh, Mayor, I wanted to thank you for sharing your work and stories with us. Well, I, the, so I just want to jump in there and plug the LGBT collection here at UNT. It is a massive archive, uh, so much of it made possible by the Dallas Way. Um, and there's just there's just so much in there. You could spend the I could spend the rest of my career ju just in that archive. Uh, I think so. That's one that's been great for me. Um, I'll plug like I don't have a specific archive I work mostly with newspapers uh, so a lot of them are online so you have the uh, newspapers.com which is a great resource and then you also have a couple that I only have access through the university uh, so it might be a little bit pricey but um, yeah don't don't shy away from newspaper archives also local archives are a great resource my hometown is is surprisingly enough still has all of its papers uh, printed in the news from 1920. To now still up holding in there so if you have if you come from a small town or whatever you know look around there there's something to be found add that the dallas holocaust and human rights museum is taking a lot of materials um for the lgbtq struggle and histories so that's another good place to get some information and interviews right right major and interviews yes as well which you're a part of yeah I've done one and my husband and I have done one and there's other people that are doing them right now. So it's part of their oral histories. I'm going to give a quick plug for special collections at University of Minnesota. They have fantastic resources when it comes to LGBTQ um, uh, history and culture, particularly for two-spirit history and culture. Um, there are other repositories in Canada and the United States which are also excellent. Um, but I want to echo Major and just say one of the best archives that I've ever encountered uh, are elders within Indigenous communities. Um, listen uh, to elders, learn to shut up, uh, and take in and just be a sponge because you will learn, you'll realize how little you know and how much you will learn uh, when you do that. I, I echo that, Gregory. I. I uh, have learned many things from just being a fly on the wall in the bar and just saying, I just, hey, uh, yeah, buying someone a drink. I, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a great way. Any other, any final, final thoughts, any final questions that we have? Um, uh, not seeing any. Uh, so I would just, I want to go to the, each one of the panelists and just, uh, uh, I guess just leave us with some final thoughts of what you where, where you think that um, that we uh, we stand and where we're going. Um, well, my view is pretty dim, so why don't I go first, and then maybe someone else can lift us up. 
Uh, I think we're entering some dark days. Uh, I think that a lot of the victories that we thought were so solid perhaps are not so solid. Uh, I'll just give you one example. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Mississippi abortion case. Uh, the Texas Right to Life has been very active in, in that case. And they, uh, the director of the Texas Right to Life organization wrote um, an amicus brief to file with that case in which he said openly, once we roll back Roe v. Wade, all of these other cases that depend on the privacy uh, ruling from Roe are also going to be uh, challenged and brought down. Not only the Obergefell marriage equality ruling, but he even mentioned rolling back Lawrence v. Texas. Uh, and of course, Texas has not ever repealed its sodomy law. It's still there on the books in the penal code, just theoretically not enforceable because of Lawrence v. Texas. However, every year a few people do get arrested and charged with it and it's immediately dismissed. It's kind of used as a tool of harassment. If Lawrence v. Texas gets rolled back because of uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned, I think there are several states who will simply start enforcing the sodomy laws that they never repealed. So I think we have to, we have to stay at it. We have to keep um, fighting against discriminatory laws. The, these, the victories themselves are not carved in stone. Yeah, I'll echo Dr. Phelps. I hopefully am, maybe because I'm younger, have a little bit more of a uh, positive outlook uh, in seeing how people are trying to fight against what's going on and what's happening in the world and how active, you know, trans individuals are in fighting for their rights. Uh, but to Dr. Phelps' point, yeah, it, it is exceedingly grim. We're, I, I, I really hope that we can see some sort of turnaround within the next couple of years. Um, and I hope that all of our collective research and experience and activism can help you know, somehow uh, change anyone's mind, if, if not just the people who are in charge. Um, but yeah, it is, it's looking dark, but I, I have a little bit of some hope still. And that's mainly because I, I hope that, you know, that doesn't really happen. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think as historians, we should recognize that there are cycles um, and, and some of what we're seeing now is particular to our moment, but there are echoes of um, stuff that's happened in the past that, that's occurring at the moment. So um, to just sort of be cognizant of that, but also to recognize that, you know, the struggles never end um, and, and, and to recognize from, from the example of people like Major and others that, you know, you keep other, there are other people out there, lots of other people out there who think and want what you have and it's come together uh, and recognize that and, and keep on fighting because history doesn't end. It just, we keep, we need to keep at it. And, um... You know, we won our fight for marriage equality, or at least we think we did, but in the Republican platform, um, they're trying to get that repeal. That's one of their goals in the 2016 and the 2020 platform. I assume it's gonna be in the next one too. So our fight is not over. I don't know that it'll ever be over, but as long as I'm around, we're gonna keep fighting. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for all of our panelists, um, for our guests, um, thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Megan, um, for for uh, putting everything together uh, and in the teaching. Um, and I just want to shamelessly plug Bent one more time. We have two more shows uh, tonight and tomorrow, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, come see it at the University Theater. If you have your comic card, it's free, um, uh, and tickets are fifteen dollars. Um, please, please come and see the show uh, again. Two more opportunities, and I put in the chat um, a link uh, up for you for the information. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. This was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for Enjoy having me. Thank you all for joining us for the end of the teaching series for this year. Hope to see you all back next year. And thank you to the panelists. Y'all are absolutely fantastic. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Whitney. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs>